Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Adonalam Messianic Congregation. I hope y'all uh, had a great week. It, it was a pretty wild week, uh, especially um, those affected by the hailstorm uh, on Tuesday. Uh, but then again, uh, we started out the week gathering uh, at our new building and giving everybody an opportunity to uh, see our future home in Greenville. And so uh, that was exciting, and I hope that you've had a blessed week. Uh, we always like to explain that as a Messianic Jewish congregation, uh, we emphasize the Jewishness of Messiah Yeshua and the Jewishness of the New Covenant faith. And one of the ways that we do that is by using Hebrew. Uh, in some of our songs and some of our prayers, uh, but we will translate uh, the Hebrew. We will explain what we are doing because we see ourselves as a community. Uh, the one new man uh, that the Apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul, talked about in Ephesians chapter 2, Jew and Gentile uh, coming together to worship as one. And so uh, as we come together for this weekly divine appointment with the creator of the universe, uh, we trust that this service will be a blessing to you uh, as we are going to inaugurate our service in the traditional way, and that's with the lighting of the Sabbath candles. So I'm going to ask Rebecca Haberman uh, to usher in the Sabbath for us uh, with the lighting of the candles and ask you to direct your attention to the front. Um, frequently, by tradition, two candles are lit because we're given two primary commands in the scriptures. Uh, we're told to shamor, to keep or guard the Sabbath, and to zahor, to remember the Sabbath, Lakad show, to keep it holy. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your word, given us Yeshua our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rebecca. And now we are in the midst of a time that uh, is commanded in Scripture, though it's uh, observed uh, by tradition as Sefirat HaOmer, the counting of the Omer, uh, as we count down the seven week period between Reshit HaKatsir, the Feast of uh, First Fruits, it's often called, literally the first of the harvest, and Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And we find uh, instructions in Vayikra Leviticus 23, verses 15 and 16, which says, And you shall count unto you from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the day after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days, and then you shall offer a new mincha, uh, meat or meal or uh, grain offering unto the Lord. The seven-week count begins on the day following the weekly Sabbath of Passover, uh, at least by Sadducean timing. Uh, and the day that comes after the seven-week count will be the 50th day, which is why the feast is called Pentecost by some, uh, from the Greek connected to the number 50. Uh, we will have a blessing, and then we will announce the next day in the count, a messianic blessing. Baruch HaTadonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Asher Hatstakenu al Yudeim Munah by Yeshua Hamashiach, Bitzivanu al Sefirat HaOmer, Amen. Which means, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has justified us by faith in Yeshua the Messiah, and commanded us regarding the counting, following the waving of the sheaf. And now we'll announce the next day of the count. First in the Hebrew, Hayom Chamisha Shaloshim Yamin. Shehem Chamisha Shavuot La Omer, which means today is 35 days, which are five weeks of the seven week count from the waving of the sheaf. 
Now I'm going to call up our cantor for the evening, Eli Scott, and ask everyone to please stand uh, as we will be <laughs> chanting a prayer that is based on Deuteronomy 6.4 uh, that is called by the first name in the prayer, the Shema. And in this prayer, uh, we as a community once again affirm the oneness, the uniqueness of our God. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew and then recite the English translation, followed by the chanting of the Via Hafta, the verses that come afterwards in Deuteronomy 6. And once again, then we will have the translation. Together, the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. And now the Be'ahavta. Be'ahavta, et Adonai Elohecha, v'chol levavcha, u'v'chol nafshecha, u'v'chol me'odecha. Vehayu Adivarim Haele Asheranuhi Metsacha Hayom Aleva Vecha Veshinantam Levanecha Filiparta Bam Veshiv Techa Bevetecha Uvlech Techa Baderech Uvshach Becha Ukumecha Ukshartam Leod Al Yadecha Behayu Leto Tavod Ben Enecha Uktaptam Al Mazuzot Betecha Uvisha Orecha Behav Talgarecha Kamocha Amen. Which means, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Amen. Please join me as we open our service in prayer. Eloheinu velohavo tenu Eloheavraham Elohei Yitzchak Elohei Yaakov. Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather together, Lord, for this Mikra Kodesh this holy convocation, this sacred assembly that you call us to weekly, Lord. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that you would bless this time. Lord, we ask you to speak to the hearts of our Jewish people gathered in synagogues around the world that they would see uh, their need uh, for the Redeemer that you provided, your Son, Messiah Yeshua, that we not only have forgiveness of sin, uh, Lord, but we also have a restored relationship with you, the creator of the universe. And Lord, we just uh, seek your anointing on this service, the singing, the dancing, the worship, the praise, the message, the liturgy, the fellowship, all that we do this evening, Lord, we dedicate it to you. And we ask you to use it for your purposes and for your glory. And we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. You may be seated. And now I'm going to call up uh, Janiel Scott uh, to bring us our announcements for the week. A lot of stuff going on, so um, you may want to note it in your calendar or something. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And welcome to Adonalam Messianic Congregation. If you're a first time visitor this evening, please raise your hand so that we might recognize you. If you've not yet received a visitor's packet, we, uh, please keep your hand raised so we can get one to you. The packet contains brochures which tell you about our congregation and our services. 
You will also find a visitor's card which we would ask you to kindly fill out and place in the offering box next to the American flag after the service. Once again, we are blessed to have you with us this evening. We will be needing manpower and woman power to move various items and office furnishings so that we can start renovating our new building. We have a sign-up sheet on the materials table and we'll let you know once we are able to schedule the move. Next Friday at 7.30 p.m., we will observe Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day. We will listen to actual radio broadcasts of the events from June 1967. Make plans to be with us as we celebrate the 56th anniversary of Jerusalem coming back under Jewish control. And two weeks from tomorrow, on Saturday, May 27th, at 7.30 p.m., we will be celebrating Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. The Jewish people celebrate this day as the anniversary of the giving of the Torah, and, it's traditional, and it is traditional to stay up all night studying the Torah. We will have teachings late into the night that night. Christians celebrate it as Pentecost, based on the events in Acts 2. One week from Tuesday, on May 23rd, we will be starting a midweek study at 7.30 p.m. We will be talking about sensitivity and sharing with the Jewish people and starting a Hebrew class. And now we pray the Lord's blessings upon you and hope that you will feel his sweet spirit as you worship with us this evening. Once again, Shabbat Shalom. A lot of things going on with two buildings, and, and um, we just want you to uh, sign up if you're willing to uh, help us with the move. I think there will be some uh, furniture, but there will also be some really light items, and I realize that you can't know for sure if you don't know when it is, but we understand that if you sign up and you're not able to make it because of when they end up asking us to do it, um, but we just want hopefully give people an opportunity so we know who to contact uh, when we find out when it will be. Now we will chant the traditional prayer known as the Vishamru, which means, and they shall keep. This prayer is uh, the Hebrew of Shemot, Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. And we will chant the Hebrew, and then we will have the English translation. Uh, we will recite it afterwards, and we have added a messianic paragraph to the end that is actually uh, verses that we will be reading this evening in the scripture portion as well. Together, the Vishamru. Vishamru, Together the translation. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat to observe it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. 
It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased from work and rested. And we know our Messiah Yeshua observed the Shabbat. In the New Covenant Scriptures we are told, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Amen. Now we are going to enter into the scripture portion of our service, and I will call forward our ARC opener, Jay Frazier, uh, as well as Randall Anderson, who will be leading us in this portion of the service. And we would ask that you would please stand as the ARC is opened. The ARC is a traditional name for the furniture that houses the scroll containing the first five books of the Bible, known as the five books of Moses. The ARC the term Ark also reminds us of the Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of the Lord dwelt. Shabbat Shalom, y'all. And it came to pass, whenever the Ark went forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unique is our God, great is our Lord, holy and revered is his name. Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mount, for the Lord our God is holy. Amen. I will now ask our scripture readers to come forward. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Brian, son of Yeshua, and Rivka, Rebecca, daughter of Yeshua, who have come up to honor God and his word. May the Holy One bless them and their families, and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of their hands. Amen. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Torah. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Le'olam Bless the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Baruch Adonai. Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher bachar benu miko ha'amim, venatam nahu et torato, baruch ata adonai, notein ha'torah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This is the 22nd day of the second month on the Hebrew calendar, the month of Iyar. Our Torah reading for this evening is taken from Leviticus, chapter 26, verses 3 through 7. In Hebrew, <clears throat> in Hebrew the name of the book is Vayikra. We'll be reading from chapter 26, verses 3 through 7, found on page 141 of the Complete Jewish Bible. If you live by my regulations, observe my mitzvahs, and obey them, then I will provide the rain you need in its season. The land will yield its produce, and the trees in the field will yield their fruit. Your threshing time will extend until the grape harvest, and your grape harvesting will extend until the time for sowing seed. 
you will eat as much food as you want and live securely in your land. I will give you shalom in the land, and you will lie down to sleep unafraid of anyone. I will rid the land of wild animals. The sword will not go through your land. You will pursue your enemies, and they will fall before <clears throat> they will fall before your sword. Amen. <clears throat> the blessing following the reading of the Torah. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Natan Lanu Torah Emet Bechayi Olam Natan Betocheinu Baruch Atah Adonai Notein HaTorah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And now for the congregational response following the reading of the Torah. Bezot HaTorah, Asher Samoshe, Livnei B'nei Yisrael Alpi Adonai, Be'yad Moshe. Moses placed before the children of Israel. It is in accord with the Lord's command by the hand of Moses. A tree of life it is for those who take hold of it. <coughs> its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Turn us to the Lord to you, and let us return. Renew our days as old. Now for the blessing before the reading of the half Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chose the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. <clears throat> Our half Torah portion for this evening is from Jeremiah chapter 32 verses 21 to 24. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Yirmiyahu Hanavi. We'll be reading from chapter 32 verses 21 to 24 found on page 603, Complete Jewish Bible. You brought your people of Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and miracles, with a strong hand and outstretched arm, and with great terror. Then you gave them this land, which you had sworn to their ancestors that you would give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. They entered and took possession of it, but they did not pay attention to your voice, did not live according to your Torah, and did nothing of all you ordered them to do. Therefore, you made this a complete disaster befall them. The siege works are already there. They have come to the city to capture it. And the city, by means of sword, famine, and plague, is being handed over to the custom fighting against it. What you foretold is being fulfilled. You see it yourself. Amen. The blessing following the reading of the Haftarah. 
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all ages, righteous throughout all generations. You are the faithful God, promising and then performing, first speaking, then fulfilling, for all your words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words, for no word of yours shall remain unfulfilled. You are a faithful and merciful God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who are faithful in fulfilling your words. Amen. Amen. And now the blessing before the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu Mashiach Yeshua, Amen. <laughs> Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Our Brit HaKadoshah portion for tonight is from Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. Again, we'll be reading from Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21, found on page 1294, Complete Jewish Bible. Now when he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, on Shabbat, he went to the synagogue as usual. He stood up to read, and he was given a scroll of the prophet Yeshayahu. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of Adonai is upon me because he has appointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the imprisoned and renewed sight to the blind, to release those who have been crushed, to proclaim a year of favor of Adonai. After closing the scroll and returning it to the Shamash, he sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He started to speak to them. Today, as you heard it read, this passage of the Tanakh was fulfilled. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> And now, the blessing following the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu hadevar ha'emet, bechai olam nata betocheinu. Baruch atah Adonai, notein ha'brit ha'chadashah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. <coughs> when the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark, Clothe your priests with righteousness. May those who have experienced your faithful love shout for joy. Hallelujah! For the sake of your servant David, do not delay the return of your Messiah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word in the Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. When the ark is closed, y'all may be seated.
Please join me in reciting He Being Merciful. He Being Merciful forgives iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently he turns away his anger and does not stir up all his wrath. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, it has been quite a week, a lot going on. Um, last Sunday, we had the tour of our new building, and we had plenty of excitement about that, right? A 10-year search, uh, plus a lot of miracles, have enabled us to purchase that building. Um, <clears throat> and then on Monday, I was talking to someone in Israel, and they were saying that it was hard to be outdoors. Now, there are two possibilities um, for that issue. The first one is, uh, and what they were really mentioning, was all the smoke from the bonfires. Anybody know why there were bonfires in Israel on Monday? Uh, it was Lag Baomer, the 33rd day of the Omer. Uh, and of course, they uh, count the Omer based on the Pharisaic timetable, a different one than we're using. Um, I've kind of concluded that uh, in the Messianic congregations, at least the, the rabbis that I interact with in the uh, IAMCS, um, it's about 50-50 in terms of the Pharisaic versus the Sadducean timetable. And we'll talk about that more on Shavuot. Um, but Lag um, Baomer, the term uh, comes from the Hebrew letters uh, representing the number 33. Uh, in in um, Hebrew, the uh, numbers are represented by letters. In traditional Judaism, the counting of the Omer is a time of semi-mourning uh, tied to events associated with a second Roman revolt that took place uh, in 135 AD or CE uh, under Bar Kokhba. Jewish people use CE uh, for common era. Uh, even though it flips from BCE, before the Common Era, era to CE, the Common Era, right at the exact same time that the Christian calendar goes from BC to AD. Pure coincidence, I suspect. Um, <clears throat> anyway, they just don't want their calendar to be uh, linked to Yeshua. But um, during the counting of the Omer, observant Jewish people, because it's a time of semi-mourning, semi uh, do not have weddings or cut their hair, except on one day, Lag Baomer, uh, when the mourning is interrupted and weddings are performed and haircuts are given. Like my haircut? <laughs> Actually, that was just a coincidence. It was just kind of getting long and unruly, and we decided it was time for it to go. Um, <clears throat> Another Lagba Omer tradition is to light bonfires based on a legend that says the rabbi who wrote, who wrote the uh, Zohar, uh, which is a Kabbalistic mystical uh, book, uh, Zohar means splendor or radiance, and the rabbi is said to have died on Lagba Omer. Now, also, um, Palestinian militants began firing rockets uh, into Israel when one of their leaders died uh, in a jail in Israel due to a hunger strike uh, this past week as well. And Israel has been taking out leaders of Islamic Jihad in retaliation, and uh, this cycle tends to um, escalate. Uh, they, the, they launch more rockets, Israel takes out more leaders. So far they've launched about 800 rockets, and we just need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. However, um, <clears throat> as long as these cycles go on, uh, it is a blessing that Israel is able to take out terrorist leaders who otherwise would be uh, making plans to kill innocent women and children in Israel. And then, as I mentioned, there was the hailstorm on Tuesday. Uh, we actually lost a tree on our new property in the storm. 
And we also had uh, one congregant who sustained some vehicle damage. I hope none of you uh, had any, any damage. He showed me a picture of the hailstones. They were bigger than, he had an egg in the middle and the hailstones around the eggs uh, are, are larger than, than the egg. So it's no surprise um, that it did some damage. The ones I saw were uh, quarter size or so and um, they would hit the car, but fortunately they would just bounce right off without causing damage. And that's not all. Uh, have any of you heard about the Isaiah 62 fast? Yes. No. Yes. Okay. I, I have some yeses. Um, <clears throat> it's a 21-day fast uh, started by the head of the International House of Prayer. And the purpose of the fast is to have millions of people praying and fasting for Israel. Uh, they are, people are asked to pray one hour per day from May 7th through May 28th reminding the Lord of his salvation promises and plans for Jerusalem and Israel. It's based on Isaiah 62 verses 6 and 7. Uh, these words may sound familiar to you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all day and all night. They will never keep silent. You, meaning those who are interceding, who uh, remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And they've suggested fasts such as eating only one meal per day, drinking only water, no other beverages, eating only vegetables. Sounds like the weak person in Romans 14, but that's just a side view you can take a look at if you'd like. Um, <clears throat> or even fasting from media instead of food. How many of us could do that? Um, that'd be a challenge. No internet, uh, no cell phone, no texting. No, I, I don't have to explain to you what fasting from media is, but um, about the only time we do that is, is on Yom Kippur or during the conference a lot of times. When we go to the conferences, you're so busy with the schedule of the conference uh, that, that sometimes you're not keeping up, certainly with world events. Last week, we were blessed by David Haberman uh, bringing the message. Uh, his message was entitled, Cats in the Cradle. Um, I don't know if y'all remember, actually, that wasn't the title of his message. But anyway, he mentioned that song. And in the song, if you'll remember it, the father never had time for the son. And when the son grew up, he, like his father, was unable to find time for his father. New jobs a hassle, kids have the flu. Y'all fill in the rest. Yes, sure, nice talking to you. Okay, the father realizes his boy has grown up just like him. And David was suggesting to us that we need to find time for our Heavenly Father. We, we need to make sure that when he invites us to spend time with him, we are not too busy. And when does he invite us to spend time with him? He's laid out these divine appointments from the portion that we read last week uh, in Leviticus 23. In the Hebrew, they're referred to as the Moadim. Uh, sometimes that's translated as feasts. But as you know, if you've been coming for any length of time, the Hebrew word for feast is chag. And uh, we always emphasize the ch because without the ch, it'd be hog. And hog is not kosher. But um, <coughs> Moedim really has the idea of appointed time or set time. Uh, and uh, weekly, the Lord has a moed, a set time that he desires to meet with his people. We talk about this often when we refer to the Shabbat, the Sabbath, as a weekly divine appointment. Um, <clears throat> and on a number of these Moedim, uh, we are to have a Mikra Kodesh, a holy convocation, a sacred assembly. And that's exactly what we're doing this evening. Leviticus 23 verse 3 says, Work may be done for six days, but the seventh day is a Shabbat of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You are to do no work. It is a Shabbat to Adonai, a Sabbath to the Lord. Uh, additionally, these divine appointments, the Moedim, are also observed at seven other times throughout the year. We call these, <coughs> excuse me, the annual Moedim, including uh, the one that is coming up next, Shavuot, Chag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, 
uh, Leviticus 23, verses 17 through 20, describe what we are to do on Shavuot. And then Leviticus 23, verse 21 says, you're to make a proclamation on the same day that there is to be a holy convocation and you should do no regular work. This is a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. So we are going to observe Shavuot uh, according to the scriptural instructions. Now, some of those are associated with the temple being in existence. So we're not going to uh, bring any uh, animal sacrifices to offer up. Uh, and there's also loaves that are brought to the priest to wave. But as we mentioned during the announcements, uh, we will be staying up all night studying the scriptures, or at least a good part of the night, studying late into the evening. And that's because uh, Shavuot on the Pharisee calendar is thought to be the anniversary of the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. And so that is a tradition uh, that has developed to study the Torah all night. Um, an import, another important aspect of these appointed times is Yeshua's fulfillment. Uh, he actually has fulfilled the first four of the seven. He was slain on Passover. This is going to be a quick review. Uh, slain on Passover in the ground on Chag Matzah, unleavened bread. Uh, resurrected on first fruits, uh, Reshit HaKatsir, the first day of the counting of the Omer. And on the fourth divine appointment, Chag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, Yeshua sent the Comforter, uh, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. These appointed times also serve as memorials of events in the past. They help us to more clearly see God's plan of redemption for us today. And they also cause us to look forward to events yet to come, uh, to the fulfillment of the final three uh, annual appointed times, likely by Yeshua in his second coming. But as I often point out, we don't spend a lot of time trying to predict what's going to happen in the future because we have a hard enough time just agreeing on what has already happened and what it means. So we kind of put our, our energy uh, mostly into that. This week we have another double portion uh, in the Torah. Uh, as we are uh, going to finish the book of Vayikra Leviticus. The first portion is called Bahar, uh, which means in the mountain. Uh, talking about Mount Sinai, where Moshe, Moses, is receiving instructions from the Lord. Now thus far, the book of Leviticus has been primarily associated with uh, instructions for the holiness of the people and the Kohanim, the priests. Uh, and also, uh, it has laid out these uh, holy days uh, that are to be observed by the uh, children of Israel, including the weekly Sabbath. And in Leviticus 25, verse 2, we find a different type of Sabbath, a Sabbath of the land that is to be observed every seven years, when no field is to be seeded and no vine is to be pruned. The provision of the food for the people in the seventh year will not come from man's efforts. You know, we think about the year of Jubilee and we think about these sabbatical years and, and we kind of, you know, see them as blessings that the Lord has instructed the people to have these times where there is release, where there is uh, freedom is granted. But what we don't realize or may not think about as much as, as we probably should is that they were now having to rely on the Lord completely for their food. Uh, you know, that'll really get your attention. That'll really test your faith and in some ways grow your faith as the food isn't growing, but the Lord is, at least not by man's efforts, but the Lord provides. And that shouldn't be a surprise because he did the same thing uh, when the Israelites were in the wilderness. Uh, if you remember, he provided manna, Manhu, what is this? Uh, the, the food that fell from the sky for the Israelites uh, to be able to have sustenance. And not only was the food provided, but what happened on the sixth day? According to Exodus 16, verse 29, the manna would last for two days, uh, even though the rest of the time it wouldn't keep overnight. But on this particular day, the Lord made it last 
uh, longer so that uh, the people would not have to do the work of gathering the manna on the Sabbath. The resting of the land every seven years serves as a reminder that the land belongs to the Lord, even though the scriptures reveal that he has sovereignly chosen to give the land to the Jewish people. Uh, and the resting of the land, uh, I kind of uh, suggested a little bit earlier that it's a time of release. Uh, in the Hebrew, the word for release is Shemitah. Uh, and that's because of the release found in Deuteronomy 15, verse 1, which says, At the end of every seven years, you are to have a Shemitah, a, a canceling of debts. Uh, and, you know, that seems like something from long ago, and maybe it's not very important to, to us today. But according to 2 Chronicles 36, verse 21, the length of the time that the Israelites were captive in Babylon, what, 70 years, was tied to their failure to observe the Shemitah, this uh, seven-year time of release. According to Leviticus 25, verses 8 through 10, after seven Shemitah years, on the tenth day of the seventh month, a blast is to be sounded on the shofar, consecrating the 50th year as a yovel in the Hebrew, a jubilee in the English, uh, as we sang earlier, as freedom is proclaimed throughout the land to all its inhabitants. And we are here proclaiming freedom, proclaiming liberty tonight. We're here to proclaim freedom through Messiah Yeshua, who says in Yochanan, John 8, verse 32, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It is easy, as I said earlier, to allow uh, this world and its demands to cause us, even as believers, uh, to perhaps find ourselves uh, in bondage, uh, feeling like that we are not free to uh, make a choice to say, okay, on this day, I'm going to uh, set it aside unto the Lord. Um, there's so many demands. There used to be blue laws where everything was closed on Sunday. Well, that made it really tough to observe the Shabbat uh, if you were working all week. And there's other aspects uh, as people don't uh, really seem to observe the Sabbath, even though you had the blue laws. Nonetheless, the people were, were trying to observe the Sabbath in some way. Uh, in in may, many neighborhoods, they'll schedule parties for Friday nights uh, or even during the day on Saturday. I think that like college football, they play games on Saturday afternoon or something. You may have noticed that. There, there's lots of temptations to say, okay, Lord, um, <clears throat> I'm going to try and set aside this day for you, but there are so many other things that uh, can cause us to feel pressured um, to do something else on that day. But what we have to realize is when Yeshua said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, he was talking to a people who were under Roman occupation. That if a Roman soldier handed him the, the load they were carrying, handed a person the load they were carrying, they were bound to carry it uh, for one mile. And, and so uh, there were a lot of rules that were associated with their being uh, in, uh, under occupation in this world. But the freedom that Yeshua was talking about uh, is a freedom from the bondage that this world places upon us, as well as the ultimate uh, freedom that we can experience in this world, and that's freedom from the bondage of sin. <clears throat> freedom is not just another word uh, for nothing left to lose. It's a mighty, powerful blessing that the Lord desires us to experience. Uh, when he saw our people in bondage in Egypt, he sent a deliverer. When he saw that our people would be in bondage to one another, he established the Shemitah, the release. And when we were servants to our flesh and to sin, we were also in bondage, but he sent a deliverer, the ultimate deliverer, his son Yeshua, the prophet greater than Moses, uh, that we might truly be delivered, that we might truly be set free. So you may have come in tonight 
and you may have felt some sort of bondage. Uh, it can be bondage from a sin that just, it seems like no matter what, uh, there's no victory. Uh, it can be in bondage because it, it can be a bondage of legalism, saying, okay, the Bible says this, and so I have to do that. Or, um, you know, people are forcing me to do something that I won't, don't want to do. My boss wants me to work on, on Saturday, and, and I don't know what to do about that. Uh, I, I get calls along those lines. Um, not, uh, uh, un, um, it's not unusual for that to happen. People will call me up and say, what do I do? Um, but the reality is um, our freedom, our deliverance, uh, is a freedom to obey the Lord based on having that freedom. It's not a freedom to do whatever we want, although we can, but the freedom in, in the description in the Hebrew of what the word um, freedom means is actually the freedom to choose what we want to do so that our service to him will be based on love uh, rather than a feeling of compulsion, uh, rather than out of legalism. And the good news is that's exactly what the Lord wants. In Yochanan John 14, verse 15, Yeshua said, we're to keep his commandments. Based on what? Our love for him. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Our obedience to the Lord's instructions are to be based on love. They're because of our love for him, and we have love for him because he first demonstrated love towards us. We've received right. the unconditional love of our creator. And that word unconditional really creates problems for us. Because it means that we were loved when we didn't deserve it. But we're commanded to do that to others. The world says love others when they deserve it. When they do something right, we let them know that we will bestow our love upon them. Uh, frequently in the world, you go into marriage counseling. And the first thing the counselor tries to do is, is kind of, uh, you know, negotiate and say, well, if this person does this, will you agree to do that? That's the opposite of unconditional love. And the more we understand the unconditional love we received, the easier it will be to demonstrate it towards others. And, you know, you may be thinking, oh, you know, it's not, it's not that hard. Just take the most difficult person in your life and demonstrate unconditional love towards them. And we will truly understand what the Lord has done for us. Uh, you know, it, it says, uh, <clears throat> while we were yet sinners, Messiah died for us. And so we, we have been blessed. No matter what is going on in our lives, no matter what is going on in the world, we still have that gift of salvation. There's nothing we could do to earn it. There's nothing we could do to deserve it. We can't come up with enough money or uh, amass enough money to be able to purchase it. God provided it freely because of his love for us. What a blessing. And we should not take it for granted because the price was uh, beyond anything in this world. It was the price of the blood of his son. Getting back to the Yovel. Uh, any lands that have been sold are returned to their original owners in the year of Jubilee. <laughs> this way, each tribe continues to keep its land, even if it has been sold off at some earlier point. Uh, the land is also uh, to be given a second year of rest during the Yovel. Every seven years, we have to trust him to provide food for one year, but after the seventh uh, sequence of that, the seventh set of seven years, there's an extra year added on. He has to, he's providing for two years. And actually, it goes into the third year because I'm not a farmer, but y'all can probably figure this one out. When you put the seed in the ground, it doesn't sprout, sprout the next minute. So there's a certain amount of time into the third year where they're relying on the Lord um, to provide for their food. According to Leviticus 25, verse 24, in the event uh, an Israelite who is poor uh, finds himself having to sell his land, uh, he's to include the right of redemption. Uh, in Hebrew, it's geulah, uh, is how we say redemption. Redeemer 
is go L. Um, and you'll see that come into play uh, in a little bit. We also uh, have that term in the Adon alum when we sing about um, go Elaning. I, th I think that's it. Anyway, we'll see next time we sing it. Um, <clears throat> I'll have to think about the words. The right of redemption is to permit any seller's close family member to redeem the land uh, that the family member has sold if they come up with the money. And we actually see an example of this in the Haftarah portion that we read earlier this evening. In Jeremiah 32, verse 8, where the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah, revealing that his cousin, Hanamel, will approach him to buy back his field in Anatot, a city outside of Jerusalem. And Jeremiah's right to, uh, to purchase or redeem the field comes from the instructions that we've just read in the Torah portion. Um, <clears throat> and in Jeremiah 32, we also find an indication that the land of Yehudah, the land of Judah, will once again belong to God's people. This is significant because uh, Jeremiah has been imprisoned because he has prophesied, much to the king's dismay, that the city of Jerusalem is about to be handed over to the king of Babylon. And according to verse 29, the Babylonians, Jeremiah 32, verse 29, the Babylonians are going to destroy the city. But we also find words of hope in Jeremiah 32, verse 15, which says, For thus says Adonai Tzivaot, which means the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards will yet again be bought in this land. And the Haftar portion ends with the Lord saying to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 32, verse 27, Behold, I am Adonai, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? That is such a blessing to know that no matter what um, concern we have, no matter what issues we are dealing with, no matter what problems that we have in this world, when we bring them to the Lord, even though it may seem impossible to us, we know for the, through the reestablishment of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, which seemed totally impossible. They'd been spread throughout the world, uh, and they were being persecuted everywhere that they'd ended up. And the land had become uh, either wasteland or in some places swamp, but it was seen as virtually uninhabitable, except for maybe uh, Bedouins, um, to inhabit, and yet, as the um, prophet said, the Lord would bring the people back into the land, that the land would once again flow with uh, milk and honey, that the sukkah of David, uh, the tabernacle of David, would be restored, that the nation uh, would be formed in a day, and all these prophecies uh, have come to pass uh, as we realize that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Uh, with God, all things are possible, is the way uh, the writer of Hebrews um, describes it. Right. Getting back to the Torah portion, a seller can redeem the land if he can accumulate the funds. Now, the question is, if you don't have the funds at the moment, what are you going to do to accumulate them? Well, one, you can work and try and accumulate more money, but two, the price is going down as you approach the Yovel. Because in the Yovel, the land's going back to the seller anyway. And so uh, the seller may get to a point where uh, he or a family member has the money then uh, to purchase the land. But if there's no one who can redeem the land, uh, once again, uh, it eventually during the Jubilee, it will revert um, to the seller. Also as described in Leviticus 25 verse 47, uh, an Israelite could find himself in a situation where he would sell himself uh, to a sojourner because of the debt. And if his near relatives can pay the price to redeem uh, their kinsmen, or if the seller himself can come up with the money at some point, he can be redeemed. So once again, we see the concept of redemption uh, in the Yovel. And actually, it's not just in that year, but as the year approaches, the redemption price becomes lower and lower. Our new covenant portion tonight was selected because it may tie into the concept of the Yovel. Yeshua has just spent 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by Hasatan, uh, the adversary. 
And after his time of testing, he returns to the Galilee, uh, where reports have spread throughout the countryside about the miracles that he has performed. And Yeshua goes to his hometown of Nazareth, or Nazareth. And as was his custom, as we read earlier, as we read every Friday night, he's in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And he stands up to read from the scroll of the prophet Yeshayahu, Isaiah. He reads Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. The Ruach of Adonai Elohim, the Spirit of the Lord, is upon me because uh, he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of Adonai's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn. Now, while some think Yeshua's description of this year of favor uh, is a reference to the freedom that comes at the Yovel, uh, it is also described, as we just read, as a day of God's vengeance. And that sounds more like it could be the year when Messiah returns. Um, but Yeshua also says, today as you heard it read, this passage of the Tanakh was fulfilled. So the people are thinking to themselves of all these blessings that are described in this passage. And they figure the hometown boy is going to deliver. Let's see what he's going to do. Because once again, they've heard about the miracles that he's done elsewhere. Uh, but here's what happens according to Mark 6, verse 5. So he could do no miracles there other than lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Now, if you were one of the sick people, that was probably pretty good. But they were expecting much more. They'd heard about him casting out demons. They'd heard about him cleansing Sarah'an, uh, raising people from the dead. According to Luke 4, verse 29, the people are angry and are ready to throw Yeshua off a cliff. But he just walks right through the crowd, leaves town, uh, because as he predicts in Luke 4, verse 24, and he knows from what happened to Jeremiah, a prophet is described as being without honor in his own hometown. This is just a sign of how much we tend to take for granted those who are closest to us. Uh, to me, one of the greatest ironies in the life of a believer um, is the struggle to treat those closest to us as nicely as we treat strangers that come across our paths. You know, we say thank you and, and please and no problem. And somebody else, you know, a, a close family member asks us to do something. We're like, are you kidding? Do you know what's on my schedule today? You know, the words no problem don't seem to come into the conversation at that point. And so uh, it, we really have to realize that those closest to us are the most important, and we should not take them for granted. And like I said earlier, display an unconditional love. Display it towards those closest to you. Uh, I, I mentioned earthly counseling uh, and, and how well it works to try and negotiate a, a deal where you get what you want by the other person uh, being willing to um, do something that they may not want to do. But the reality is, the way relationships work the way God intended them to is for all of us to give the way he has given to us unconditionally. <laughs> if both of us in a relationship are contributing 100% towards the relationship, there's no opportunity to get into arguments over who's right and who's wrong or who deserves this and, and who deserves that. Now, uh, quickly, I also need to cover the final portion in the book of Leviticus to keep up with the rabbis. Uh, it's called Bahukotai uh, and starts in Leviticus 26, verse 3, where the Lord says through Moses, if you live Bahukotai, by my statutes, by my regulations, and then we find a number of blessings uh, that we read earlier that he will bestow on the Israelites. The right amount of rain when it's needed, shalom, peace in the land, no need to fear their enemies or even wild animals. Their numbers would increase and their crops would be bountiful. In Leviticus 26, verse 9, he says he will be faithful to his covenant with them. And in Leviticus 26, verse 11, he says that his tabernacle would be in their midst, uh, that he will dwell in the midst of his people. Leviticus 26, verse 12 says he would be their God and they would be his people. These are all the blessings of obedience. But then the Lord goes on to describe what happens for disobedience. 
Uh, and, and it's the opposite of these blessings. It's kind of a carrot and stick approach. And we're talking about a stick that gets bigger and bigger the more the people fail to obey him. Now, he would prefer to motivate them through blessing, just like we prefer to do with our children in most cases, hopefully uh, the vast majority of times. But sometimes that just doesn't get the job done. Motivation can also come through seeking to avoid the pain of punishment. Uh, if the Israelites reject his instructions, thereby breaking the covenant on their part, he will bring terror, disease, and chronic fever upon them. They're also told in Leviticus 26, verses 33 through 35, that failure to obey the resting of the land during the Shemitah will result in their being kicked out of the land so that the land can get its rest. As we mentioned earlier, that's exactly what happened a thousand years after these words were written during the Babylonian captivity. So just like a child is punished to let them know uh, that they are doing something that they're not supposed to be doing, Israel is often disciplined for the same purpose. Now, when you punish your child, does that mean you're never going to bless them again and will instead find some other, some other person's child that you're going to bless instead? None of us would do this. Uh, I mean, we, it sounds ridiculous until you realize that that's what the mistaken concept called replacement theology suggests, and that's believed by a number of believers in the body of believers. Uh, it's taught in seminaries from books that uh, are hundreds of years old, uh, commentaries that are that old that don't take into account the Lord proving faithful to the promises that he made to the Jewish people by reestablishing them uh, in their land. The, the concept of replacement theology says because of Israel's rejection of Yeshua, Israel loses its unconditional everlasting covenant relationship with the Lord. Now, of course, the description of their relationship as unconditional should mean that you can't lose it. Now, that's not an individual promise. Uh, individual Israelites could be cut off from the nation, could be cut off from the promises. Even the sojourners in their midst were subject to the same rules. But as a nation, God said that he would not um, forsake his people because he is faithful to all the promises that he has made. And this is also... Um, shown in Leviticus 26 verses 44 and 45. I'm going to read it uh, in the King James, even though most of our translations are messianic, just so you'll know this isn't uh, flavored from a, a messianic translation. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will, for their sakes, remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt, in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. In Leviticus, and, and as I often point out, if God doesn't keep his promises to Israel, uh, that he has made through his covenant relationship with them, what uh, assurance do we have uh, of the promises that he has made to us? And in reality, it's the opposite. We see that he is faithful to the promises that he has made to Israel. And therefore, our promises, which we obtain through the nation of Israel, through the covenants that were made with them, we know that God will be faithful uh, to his covenant promises. In Leviticus 27, verses 30 through 32, we find the final instruction in the book of Leviticus. And it actually concerns the tithe of the herd and the field. Uh, whatever is harvested, is harvested from the land, one-tenth is to go to the Lord uh, and becomes holy as a result. To redeem the tithe of the harvest, an additional 20% must be given to the Lord. And in terms of animals, every tenth animal was to be given to the Lord as a tithe. Now, as we often point out, the tithe represented giving one-tenth back to the Lord as an acknowledgement that he is the one who has provided all of our blessings to begin with. But it's also an act of faith demonstrating our trust in him that he will continue to provide for our needs. Now, when we finish reading a book of the Torah, it's traditional to say, Chazak, Chazak, Venit Chazak, which means be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. 
So tonight we've seen the significance of the concept of redemption. Uh, in the um, Adon Alam, we read, the, I told you Goel is redeemer. Uh, in the song, we'll sing Vachai Goeli, which means, uh, and my redeemer lives, is what it literally uh, says. And the, that, that's actually the traditional Jewish um, words, but we believe that uh, the, the song describing not only the uniqueness of the creator of the universe, uh, which is how Odon Olam can be transferred, Lord of the universe or Lord of the world, um, but also uh, the idea that he would provide redemption for his people, that he would send uh, a redeemer. Uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> the one uh, who would redeem them uh, also is described in Exodus 6, verse 6. Uh, the Goel Yisrael, the Redeemer of Israel, they would be redeemed with an outstretched arm, uh, according to Exodus 6, verse 6, and as Jeremiah mentions in his prayer in uh, Jeremiah 32, verse 17 as well. And this redemption is available not just to Israel, uh, but to all who would call upon the sacrifice of Yeshua for forgiveness for their sin. As we mentioned earlier, his blood uh, is the price that was paid for our redemption. All can be redeemed by the sacrifice of God's Son. Uh, and um, we are redeemed out of our slavery to sin. We're no longer slaves to sin, but we can choose to be slaves of righteousness, serving the creator of the universe as our master unto holiness. Now, maybe um, you have not uh, asked the Lord to um, provide his sacrifice on your behalf before. But you can receive the freedom that he has provided through the redemption provided by his son. So I would ask uh, with every eye closed and with every head bowed, if you've never accepted Yeshua's sacrifice on your behalf before, uh, but you want to receive God's gift of salvation provided unconditionally for you, you, you can't do anything to merit this. All you have to do is raise your hand to say yes to him. Uh, if you're watching on video or, or even if uh, the Lord has revealed to you tonight that you need that sacrifice, the only way of redemption, uh, the only way that we can be seen righteous in God's sight, the only way we can merit uh, spending the rest of eternity in his presence. Is there anyone? We thank the Lord for, for his provision. We thank the Lord, those of us uh, who have raised our hand at one time, who have made that decision to receive Yeshua's sacrifice. But perhaps um, you are here even as a believer, um, but you didn't realize that you could be in bondage to this world. Uh, you didn't realize that uh, the enemy will heap condemnation and guilt upon you. But Yeshua came to set us free from condemnation and, and guilt. We can be forgiven of our sins. We can be cleansed from all unrighteousness and then we are able to serve the Lord in that freedom. We're able to choose to serve him. Uh, you know, maybe you've been serving him up to this time, but you felt like you had to. You can have that burden lifted tonight and just say, Lord, I want to serve you because I love you because you first loved me. Or perhaps you've been in bondage to sin and selfishness, uh, and now you're ready for a new master. You know, maybe it's money, but money doesn't have to be your master. Maybe it's selfishness, selfish desires. You can say, I no longer want that for my master. Maybe it's seeking after man's approvals or the trophies of this world, whatever it might be. Uh, whatever in your life, uh, in this world, seems to have had mastery over you, you can be set free tonight. Because as we read earlier, if the sun sets you free, you are truly freed. So if you want to cast off those chains of bondage and say, Lord, I want you to be my one and only master. I want to trust in you in a greater way from this day forward. Still with heads bowed and eyes closed, I would just ask you to raise your hand as a sign that you're making this commitment between you and the Lord. And we're going to say a brief prayer of encouragement. As Lord, you see the hands that have been raised. And Lord, we thank you that you have redeemed us through the work of our deliverer, Messiah Yeshua. And Lord, we seek your deliverance even this night. Deliver us from bondage, Lord. Whatever bondage in this world, uh, whatever legalism may have 
uh, caused us to think that uh, we had to do certain things to please you. Uh, Lord, we now realize that you want us to not uh, feel like we have to do it, but you want us to uh, desire to do it because we uh, trust in you, that we are free to serve you because we love you. And we thank you, Lord, for freeing us tonight. Uh, we cast off the chains of bondage. We cast off the chains of selfishness. Uh, we cast off the chains of lying, of seeking approval from this world, uh, the chains of greed, the chains of any sin in our lives that uh, we have not yet been able to overcome. And Lord, we thank you uh, that you can bring us out of Egypt into the promised land where we can experience victory in you uh, in areas where we may never have before. And we ask all these things in the name of our Messiah Yeshua. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to all who had a part in our service this evening. Remember Jerusalem Day next Friday. Uh, the radio broadcast we're going to listen to, uh, I found them on the internet, I think about 10 years ago, and they've taken them down. So they're no longer available. They're actual, uh, not only radio broadcasts, but even videos uh, associated with them uh, from those days in June 1967. So we encourage you to join us. Also, two weeks from tomorrow, uh, Saturday evening, May 27th, uh, we will be celebrating Shavuot, and that's actually uh, when that 21-day fast uh, ends that has been proclaimed as well. It's actually the 28th, which they're observing as Pentecost, uh, and we're observing as Shavuot. <clears throat> Once again, I'm going to call up Eli Scott uh, to pronounce the traditional blessings that are recited at the end of the Sabbath service, the blessing over the fruit of the vine, we call it the Kiddush, comes from the same root as Kadosh, which means holy, and the blessing over the bread as we thank the Lord for his provision. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who grace the fruit of the vine. Amen. And we say Lachayim, a traditional Jewish toast that means to life because the Lord tells us that he sets before us life and death, blessing and curse, and encourages us to choose life and choose blessing. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread and water and food from the earth. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Eli. And uh, <clears throat> now I'm going to ask everyone to please stand uh, as we are going to pronounce a blessing. It's actually the Lord's words of blessing that he instructed Moshe, uh, Moses to have his brother Aharon, Aaron, the first Kohen Gadol, the first high priest, pronounce these words of blessing as the Lord's words of blessing over his people. So we encourage you to receive these, Lord's, these words of blessing from the Lord this evening. Yevarech lecha Adonai Ve'yishmorecha Ya'er Adonai Panava lecha V'chunecha Yisa Adonai Panava lecha Ve'yasem lecha Shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and show you his favor. May the Lord lift up his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of Messiah Yeshua, may we all go in peace. Amen. Amen. And now we'll have our closing song. Uh, it's the Ein Kel Ohenu. It's sung in the synagogue liturgy in the Hebrew. Um, we did it in the synagogue I attended growing up, but I had no idea what I was singing because we didn't sing the English. But tonight we're going to sing it in Hebrew, and then we'll sing the English so you'll know what you've just sung. En Kelohenu means there is no one like our God. En Kelohenu, en Kadonenu, en Kamokenu, en Kamoshienu, mi Kelohenu, mi Kadonenu, mi Kamokenu, mi Kamoshienu, no de Lelohenu, no de Ladonenu, no de Lemokenu, no de Lemoshienu. 
Baruch Eloheinu, Baruch Adoneinu, Baruch Makeinu, Baruch Mushineinu, Atahu Eloheinu, Atahu Adoneinu, Atahu Makeinu, Atahu Mushineinu. And now the English. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our Lord. There is no one like our King. There is no one like our Messiah. Who is like our God? Who is like our Lord? Who is like our King? Who is like our Messiah? We give thanks to our God. We give thanks to our Lord. We give thanks to our King. We give thanks to our Messiah. Blessed be our God, blessed be our Lord, blessed be our King, blessed be our Messiah. You are the one our God, you are the one our Lord, you are the one our King, you are the one our Messiah. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the time of fellowship. Have a great week in the Lord. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.